Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first lunch hour lecture at UCL of our second term. Um, we're very pleased to have you with us here today. I hope you're all keeping well and healthy and managing under these most extraordinary of circumstances. Um, my name is Heidi Geismar. I'm a professor of anthropology and I'm also one of the faculty leads working on the development of UCL East. It's our new campus that's been built on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London. And there I'm stewarding a portfolio of different activities called Culture Lab, a series of exciting new spaces dedicated to interlinked programmes of teaching, research and public engagement across the arts and humanities, the social and historical sciences and the Institute of Education. Today's lunchtime lecture is part of a series focused on UCL East that aim to give you a taster of the academic activities that we're planning, highlighting the ways in which we're imagining new forms of teaching and research, publicly engaged, reaching out towards our communities, not only around the park, not only around London, but also globally. Um, and I think you'll really get a sense of that from the lecture we're about to hear. One of the really exciting spaces that we're planning is a new collaboration between the Bartlett School of Architecture and Planning and Culture Lab. Um, it, and we're calling it the Urban Room and Memory Workshop. It's, it's an exciting public facing space that will bring together our strengths in urbanism uh, and public history, in collections supported by UCL Library and Special Collections, in digitisation and archiving. And we imagine this as a space to think about the city, to think about history, to think about heritage and the past and to create new forms and collections and new archival practices to, to feed into that conversation as it moves into the future. Um, the Urban Room and Memory Workshop is a collaboration that's been very much led by Urban Lab and today we're going to hear from Dr Claire Melhurish who's Director of the UCL Urban Laboratory which itself is a cross-faculty centre for urban research, dissemination and engagement. Claire is an architectural historian and urban anthropologist who specialises in researching the processes and impacts of transformative urban imaginaries, as she calls them, and large scale urban interventions. Um, as not only director of the Urban Lab, she also leads the Urban Lab's participation in a research cluster called Curating the City, which is part of the Centre for Critical Heritage Studies based here at UCL, but also in partnership with the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Her particular areas of expertise and interest include the modernist movement, contemporary architecture, post-colonial urban aesthetics and heritage, and urban regeneration policy and practice. And her lecture today picks up on a long-term research project exploring university-led uh, development or gentrification, um, which if you're interested in following up, you can read a fantastic report that she authored in 2015, which was commissioned by the Urban Lab and by UCL Estates to explore um, really cultural and university-led gentrification through five different case studies. And that's really been formative in supporting the work that we've been doing over many years now in the Olympic Park. Park. Her lecture today will explore the concept of university urbanism, considering the challenges and opportunities universities face as they interact with urban neighbourhoods and within cities. She will present UCL Urban Lab research in this field with a particular focus on collaborations with universities abroad at Gothenburg, Roma Tre, and UNIFESP in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we'll hear how Claire and these collaborations are exploring models for evaluating city and university relationships and really kind of learn more about Urban Lab's academic involvement in the development of UCL East. Um, so Claire, I'm going to hand over to Claire in just a moment. Just so you know, um, as per our usual format, we'll be taking questions via Slido. And the information uh, should be in the uh, event right that you signed up for to how to join. But in case you didn't receive this, you can go to sli.do, so Slido with a dot in the middle, and please enter the code LHL2. And you can type your questions in there. That's LHL2. And then we'll feed them to Claire uh, during the Q&A sessions. Um, I'll, we'll put this information up at, also at the end of Claire's talk. So, um, without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Claire Melhurish um, to take over with, for the lunchtime talk. Thank you, Claire. Thanks very much, Heidi, for that um, 
very nice introduction. And hello, everybody. Thank you to the UCL East team also for the invitation to speak in this lunch hour series um, and the first of this term. And in fact, this is a slot that's been postponed since last May um, when we were just getting to grips with doing everything virtually from home. And I certainly never imagined that I would still be in this situation or that we would all still be in the situation at the start of term to 2021 and that I would indeed be delivering this talk from home. But here we are, notwithstanding the, um, the lovely UCL background. Um, it's, it's been quite a sort of voyage of discovery really um, to sort of understand how effectively the university can um, operate through its virtual networks through this time um, that have really allowed us to continue working and collaborating together and engaging with the wider public um, as we have done during this whole period since last May. Um, it's accelerated processes of developing virtual and blended ways of teaching and researching that we've been talking about for years. And in some ways it has made international collaboration easier, um, even though we haven't been able to travel to our research sites in person. Um, and of course it's helped us to address the intensifying climate risks of physical travel. Nevertheless, this talk is going to focus on the physical and spatial characteristics and impacts of university development in urban contexts. Looking forward with optimism to a time when we can assemble again on site and share the embodied experience of community interaction and engagement with a wide range of urban stakeholders and city dwellers, which I think we're all missing. This is very much core to what the UCL Urban Laboratory has done since its founding in 2005. While the role of universities and their development projects in wider urban processes, as Heidi has explained, has been the focus of my research in urban laboratories since 2013. And this has resulted in a number of research collaborations and outputs, which I'll touch on in this talk, including, of course, our input into the development and academic planning of UCL East. So I'm just going to share my presentation. And hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so as the title indicates, I'm focusing on development understood as the construction of new buildings and spaces by universities in urban settings. But I want to frame this more broadly as a reflection on how such initiatives can help us to reimagine what cities can be. We believe that universities can and should play a part in promoting economic, social and ecological sustainability in urban contexts, addressing spatial inequalities and social injustice and making cities better and more equal environments for human habitation. So we see universities as key agents, not just in the delivery of higher education, but also in processes of integrated urbanism, drawing on the term university urbanism coined by my co-director Camillo Boano in Urban Lab. And that's why I chose this picture as my introductory image. It's the banner that greets you at the entrance to the new East Zone campus of the Federal University of São Paulo, UNIFESP in uh, Brazil, announcing this campus was born out of the struggle of the working people of the East Zone. So, This campus, which is still under construction in the repurposed buildings of an old steel factory in this sprawling, impoverished area of the urban periphery, is the most recent of seven new campuses opened by UNIFESP in and around Sao Paulo since 2003 in poor urban areas. And this one, incorporating a new cities institute focused on urban management, planning and design education, was actively campaigned for and supported by local social movements. They included communitarian, church and schools groups which helped to define the project through 50% representation and participation in a joint planning committee. And it was inspired by the vision of a workers' university for the area developed by the uh, well-known educationalist Paolo Freire in his role as education secretary for São Paulo at the end of the 80s. And it was facilitated by the radical expansion of 
public higher education under President Lula's government, which included quotas for students from state schools and ethnic minority backgrounds, which rose from 2.5% to an incredible 50% in three years. The whole public university system is now under threat from Bolsonaro's reforms. However, the vision for the East Zone campus, which enshrines the material and social history of the area in its facilities, is still to provide a center for critical urban research and teaching, alongside access courses for local people and workers, urban agriculture, and an East Zone memory and heritage center and center for peripheral studies, which are dedicated to recording oral histories and documenting the history of the surrounding working class neighborhoods. This emerging vision of how a university can engage with and actively participate in reimagining its urban context is set out by Pedro Fiori Arantes, the Vice Provost for Planning at UNIFESP, in a chapter for a new book on universities and urban heritage, which I'm co-editing with my colleagues in Curating the City, our research cluster in the uh, Centre for Critical Heritage Studies, which Heidi mentioned. Brazilian public universities have been developing critical work to understand the impacts of university expansion and development on deeply unequal cities and communities and frame urban sustainability as a complex environmental, climatic, social and economic ecology in which universities have a central role to perform. In the last two years, Urban Lab has been very pleased to host visiting research fellows Joel Felipe and Anita Kirka, working on research into the social and environmental indicators for the role of the university as a so-called anchor institution in Brazilian cities and processes of community engagement in relation to university development with reference to the development of the new UCL East campus and Urban Lab's input and research on universities and urban regeneration over the last few years. And in October 2019, I was invited to UNIFESP to present this work, exploring the renewal of the concept of the civic, public or engaged university in the UK urban context and participate in academic discussion around the translation of that concept between the UK and Brazil. In UNIFESP's new uh, Institutional Observatories Initiative, which I'll mention, I'll explain later in the talk. During my visit to Sao Paulo, I learned a lot about the incentives for Brazilian universities to combine research, teaching and outreach, working with local communities and public policy as a form of political resistance and as a commitment to social innovation and knowledge sharing through partnerships with other organisations and stakeholders. In the UK, the concept of urban regeneration has celebrated the role of architects, institutions and investors in implementing planned interventions in the name of improvement and citification, if you like, of peripheral urban areas. And the Olympic Park is a classic example of these kind of processes. It's against this background that research into the identity and function of the civic university as an example of a hybrid public-private institution in the UK has moved into an explicitly urban and spatial dimension. Universities have assumed an increasingly important role in the, uh, in the control and production of urban space linked to the development of such hybrid models of urban development and funding structures as a result, become deeply implicated in the contemporary politics of urban space and spatial justice, while displacement and inequality in European cities has rapidly increased over the past several decades. Universities, therefore, often benefiting from public subsidies need to demonstrate that their civic responsibilities extend to embrace the most disadvantaged sectors of society for whom the future has become even more bleak as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In my 2015 report, um, again, that Heidi mentioned, I explored the ways in which universities in the UK and the US have become one of the multiple urban actors and agencies involved in assembling and reassembling cities around the world to meet the needs of the post-industrial knowledge economy, projecting new urban futures through a proliferation of promises packed in, uh, packaged in rhetoric and alluring 
visual imagery. And you can see an example of that kind of imagery here. Like the University of the Arts at King's Cross and like our new campus UCL East in the Olympic Park, higher education institutions are increasingly embedding themselves in new urban developments as cultural anchors or science and technology hubs linked to enterprise zones. They're developing new urban master plans designed by international firms, which explicitly make links and physical connections with the wider city and communities beyond the academy. In assuming this role of anchor institution for urban development, universities can then be seen as actors in the wider circulation flows of urban policy and practice. And in this case, we need to think carefully and critically about what the role of the university is if we want to establish a new model for the university in the 21st century, a concept that has been extensively discussed with Urban Lab's input in the last eight years of planning for UCL East. And if we want to live up to our reputation as a publicly engaged university working in and for London and Londoners and as critical urbanists, we should recognise and marshal the resources that the university has to challenge planning norms and deliver more than, as quoted here, public open space with retail and leisure. The idea that universities can challenge the unequal distribution of cultural, social and financial capital, which defines the divided city, both through their own institutional restructuring for widening participation and through the modelling of inclusive urban and public spaces such as parks, community centres, life learning and healthcare facilities, constitutes a shift away from historic models of the university as a project of elite universal knowledge production represented by utopian and exclusionary architectural projects. And so we've seen new terminologies emerging to describe an alternative model for universities, such as living laboratory, urban extension, communiversity and collaboratoria. And this has led me to explore the ways in which narratives of identity, heritage and belonging are being mobilised by universities in different urban contexts to reimagine cities and urban life for the better in partnership with other civic institutions, community-based organisations and city authorities. We've been developing this work in Urban Lab, both in the context of UCL East and in collaboration with a number of other universities in and beyond Europe. Um, not only the University of Gothenburg and Roma Tre in Italy and UNIFES, but also the American University of Beirut in Lebanon and UTEC in Kingston, Jamaica. Much of this work has been funded by the Centre for Critical Heritage Studies, which is a partnership between the University of Gothenburg and UCL, as well as UCL City's partnership program, Rome Hub, and UNIFESP. And it will be discussed in our forthcoming book on universities and urban heritage, hopefully to be published by UCL Press at some point. One of the key insights this research offers is that the discourses and narratives which mediate and mobilise universities' spatial development projects leading towards their objectification as built form, represent a process which is more than one of simple visualization, representation or projection of the future as seen in this slide, but rather one of building social relationships among the different actors implicated in it, both within and outside the university. And in order to mobilize support for such projects and reposition universities as placemakers in the struggle against urban fragmentation, these narratives draw strongly on notions of heritage, identity and belonging in the city shaped by different disciplinary perspectives from within the academic community. I'm going to say a little bit more now about three of these cases, Gothenburg, Roma Tre, and UCL East itself, before concluding with a reflection on possible methodologies for evaluating the impact of university interventions in urban neighbourhoods. So this is the University of Gothenburg. It's um, a consolidation pro project at Campus Nakrosen, which is located at a significant historic location in the city, the site of the Gothenburg Exposition of 1923, which was subsequently redeveloped as the Liseberg Amusement Park, adjacent to the city's cultural centre, which includes the art museum, library and concert, concert hall. And later, several university buildings, including the publicly accessible university library behind it. 
It aroused considerable controversy both within the university and in the surrounding local bourgeois neighborhood, not just because of the building works involved, but also because of the university's stated commitment to, and I quote, a strong sense of civic responsibility, proximity to city life, and openness to the surrounding society, creating a place where, and I quote again, people from different places and with different backgrounds will meet and work together, yielding outcomes that will exceed the mere sum, sums of the parts. In a city highly divided by the issues of migration to Sweden, challenging assumptions around national identity, the university has positioned itself as a champion for a regenerated urban culture, which makes space for diverse communities of different ethnic and cultural heritage. The project has implicated the university in new kinds of engagements with the relevant urban planning authorities, design consultants, community organizations, and their own student and faculty bodies, which have brought these discussions to the fore. So this is Roma Tre in Rome, um, and this university, the third university in Rome, has been a principal player in the restructuring of the areas of Ostiense and Testaccio, the old industrial areas of Rome, relatively unvisited by tourists and visitors. In 1995, its settlement in the area was agreed as part of a development strategy based on reclamation and repurposing of old buildings to drive a regeneration of the economy based on cultural industries. In 1997, two wings of the redundant Matatoyo slaughterhouse, which again you can see in, in the two top images and, and the one below on the right, in Testaccio, um, for use by the Department of Architecture, um, which opened there in 2000. The professors in the department, professors of architecture and planning, along with scholars in art history and other disciplines, have played a significant part in this urban process, providing spatial and historical analyses, participating in hearings with residents, making assessments and design proposals. And in the repurposed Matatoyo, envisaged as a so-called city of the arts, fully integrated with the city, the university department sits alongside other institutions open to the public and passers-by. These include the City of Alternative Economy and the Global Village, a grassroots social centre which began illegally squatting the buildings from 1990, alongside Ararat, an organisation for Kurdish refugees. An important mediating force in this context has been Stalker, a collective of young activist architects working to maintain a public space in which a variety of different groups could meet and interact. And so we come to the Olympic Park and UCL East. And as many of you will know, UCL has been working in partnership with the London Legacy Development Corporation to develop its new site called UCL East, which signposts not only its geographical location in the east of the city, but also its areas of academic focus, so an acronym for Experiment, Arts, Society and Technology. And the UCL East vision references a commitment to creating a vibrant, diverse and accessible campus in, of and for East London, which is open and highly collaborative with external organisations. These processes have also generated over the years controversy, opposition and some uncomfortable self-interrogation as a result of the real urban encounters and spatial politics implicated in development on the ground, a deprived multi-ethnic peripheral area of blighted opportunity desperately in need of employment and affordable housing. And we know that the borough of Newham is one of the worst affected by, by the COVID pandemic. UCL's non-conformist, and I quote, effortlessly radical and egalitarian origins are emphasized in its academic vision statement for the new campus as a guarantee of its intent to, and again, I quote, discover, co-create and share new knowledge for the benefit of all. It's echoed in its promise to deliver a physical environment which will connect UCL East to its surroundings and invite people in with a vibrant public space at its heart. Whereas UCL's Bloomsbury campus architecture really comes from a root of privileged authority, as a former UCL East project director put it, 
UCL East, both physically and culturally, has this challenge of creating new, almost standalone 21st century buildings and trying to make itself part of East London. UCL's approach to this problem was to create a specialised public engagement un unit for East London, now working with the UCL project team, UCL East project team, and to impose a moratorium on architectural visualisations in the early stages of concept development and master planning in order to avoid any miscommunication with uh, local communities. In parallel, many of UCL's academics also developed relationships with local groups through different kinds of community-based research activities. And the university's urban laboratory, comprising a network of urbanists, spearheaded a consistent campaign to establish and implement an ethical, inclusive and participatory framework for university-led urban regeneration in the area. Some of those surround, some in those surrounding local communities have objected to LLDCs and UCL's rewriting of the area's urban heritage, the erasure of its industrial past and the effects of gentrification, which they fear will define its future identity and lead to their own exclusion. Ultimately, the UCL East project has made little reference either to its historic, industrial or more recent Olympic past and social identity in favour of a focus on a projected shared future heritage produced in collaboration with a wide range of partner organisations of different scales. This is embodied in the buildings of the new campus now under construction and the activities they will host as a new powerhouse for London. And this cross section on, on the bottom of this slide is an old um, image. Obviously, the site has developed um, greatly since then. And this is an image in the top left um, of, of the new buildings under construction, which is very exciting. So as Heidi mentioned again, we're very excited to be involved in the creation of a new urban room and memory workshop at UCL East in collaboration with, sorry about that, in collaboration with our culture lab partners led by Heidi. Um, and we believe that this will provide a focus for public facing, community-based, don't know why that keeps happening, um, community-based urban teaching and research with a strong emphasis on engagement with the diverse histories and identities of the local area. Um, embedded across transnational networks of migration. And I'm trying to show you this image rather persistently because it shows some of the work that we um, have done again over a number of years um, to develop this vision, um, organizing a symposium at the School of Architecture a couple of years ago, led by Sol Marti uh, Perez de Martinez, um, and some of the precedents that we've also um, looked at, such as the Casa della Città in Rome and the Aides Gallery in Berlin. Um, and so we very much hope that this will provide a strong focal point for collaboration collaborative processes of reimagining the city for the better in the future, especially post-COVID. And so this is my final slide. Um, and this just is uh, one of the most recent visualizations of the urban room as it's been constructed. Um, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint really doesn't want to show it for some reason. Um, uh, so yeah, we're very excited, looking forward to this. And if you heard Mark Tudor Jones's lecture last term, you will have heard um, more about the concept of the urban room um, as it exists, as it was, it was coined by the architect Terry Farrell in his government review some years ago. And Mark um, will have uh, explained quite a lot about the Newcastle example of an urban room that he was involved with um, again over the last few years. So it's exciting to have Mark with us at UCL now. So having said a little about each of these cases and the insights that they offer into the potential for universities to play a role in such processes of reimagining and reenacting cities, 
I want to conclude with some thoughts on how we might set about assessing and understanding the impact of university presence at different sites, acknowledging their agency and the structures of power and knowledge which shape urban space and city life. While my research between 2013 and 2016 was focused primarily on the processes involved in practices of university-led urban development, so narrative construction, planning and design, governance structures and public engagement, it wasn't so easy at that time to speculate on the impacts of such development. The projects I was studying were mostly in an early stage of development and among the first of their kind. That's changed in the intervening years, but work to assess the social and physical impacts of university development projects in urban contexts and on urban populations is still undeveloped. We still know relatively little um, about the ways in which new university developments and expansion projects can change or benefit the physical and social landscape of cities uh, compared to economic assessments of the contribution that universities can make to cities and urban regions in, in that sphere. And um, university institutions themselves have been slow to document and evaluate their impact on the urban context. The University Observatory Initiative at UNIFESP, which I mentioned at the start of the talk, offers valuable insights into the methodologies we could establish to do this. One of the primary functions of the institutional observatories established at each of UNIFESP's seven campuses uh, in, a, in and around Sao Paulo is to analyze the socio-spatial impacts of the university's presence and function in each of the municipalities in which they're located. The initiative addresses the contrast in quality of life and the cultural gulf which exists between urban centers and peripheries and responds to the catalyzing impact of popular movements, mobilization for better opportunities and improved social infrastructure in underprivileged areas. This model provides a valuable reference point then for universities such as UCL and others, including those participating in our new campus group network led by UCL East Director Paola Lettieri, which have professed a commitment to civic engagement and responsibility within cities. Urban observatories have been defined by colleagues here at UCL in STEEP as, and I quote, research organizations that work across policymaking and academia, critical in achieving sustainable urban development. They are well placed to develop and test innovative means of knowledge production and interaction between academia and decision makers in urban knowledge transition zones. Within the framework of UN Habitat's new urban agenda and the 17 sustainable development goals, the observatory is defined as a platform for data collection, knowledge generation and application in urban governance processes, which has particular pertinence to SDG 11. And I quote, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. So the observatory model embraced by Brazilian universities offers a platform for universities both to engage in knowledge translation across boundaries and for data collection by universities to facilitate reflection on and evaluation of their own role and impact in urban neighborhoods and society at large, making a key contribution to the collective societal and political effort toward, towards environmental, social and economic sustainability. Building on the work we've already established documenting the urban and social landscape in East London in collaboration with different types of partners, UCL Urban Lab will contribute to this ongoing project of evaluation through the new resources available at UCL East, including the Urban Room and Memory Workshop and the new teaching initiatives which we're developing there to pull together urban theory and practice. Today, we've moved away from a conceptualization of the university as an inward looking self-contained community, segregated from the surrounding urban fabric and embrace a vision of permeability, accessibility and integration with the wider city at different scales from neighborhood to city region. That has significant architectural and urban design implications for the planning and design of 21st century university facilities and urban contexts, which this talk hasn't examined. 
But if we visualize the university as a beacon looking out to the city, we might want to consider an architectural historical precedent before concluding, and one that Mark Tudor Jones also referenced in his talk last term, that of Patrick Geddes' Outlook Tower in Edinburgh of 1892, which he described as an educational museum in every city and village for social cohesion and public betterment, scientific but practical, and designed for practical civic work that could contribute to the evolution of cities the iconic urban observatory for the modern age, as Mark has put it. What then might a network of such observatories or contemporary outlook towers modeled by universities look like across an international scale of interconnected cities? How might it shape and evaluate the circulation and implementation of urban policies and practices? What geographers Ward, McCann and Roy have termed the assemblage of expertise and resources from elsewhere. And how might they make sense of, and I quote, the complex social lives and genealogies of policies that follow particular trajectories and bring together actors and institutions across different sites and scales from the local to the national and international, creating new networks and new communities. As this final quote from the anthropologist Chris Shaw suggests, this is a challenging project involving multi-sided analysis and a transdisciplinary approach, but work which universities are well positioned to undertake within a collaborative framework. And I'll leave you with that thought and hand back over to Heidi. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a really rich presentation and there are already quite a few questions coming through. Um, Just for those of you who may have missed my introduction, if you do want to ask a question, please go to slido, sli.do, and you can type in the code LHL2 and then you can type in your question. Um, I can see from the questions coming in, there's one that's just come in saying where on the aerial view of the area will UCL East actually be? And I wondered if we should just show that again very quickly before we go on to the more substantive questions, um, just to orient people who may not be so familiar with the project. Yeah, let me just um, try and get that back. And just while, while we're so yeah. it's here, it's called the South Lawn, and it's this site just south of the um, the what's it called the Arcelor uh, Metal orbit. Yes, yeah, and so right on the this site here, um, yeah. So this is looking sort of southeast. This is the Carpenters Estate, and this is looking out over Newham towards the east down towards Barking and Dagnum, and this is the um, Zaha Hadid Aquatic Centre. And this here, you can just see, um, is the the main Olympic stadium in the park. Fantastic, thank you. And just also to say for those of you who might want to know more about the project, there's a great website, a UCL East website. If you just Google UCL East um, your, or ucl.ac.uk slash east, I think it is, then you can get a lot more detail about all of the different buildings and academic programmes. So Claire, um, the first question that I want to put to you is from Danny, and they ask about retail and public space. And I think this is actually a great question to maybe ask you to go into a bit more detail, perhaps of your report, um, because they ask, how can we ensure that universities actually enrich their surrounding communities, not just raising the rent and displacing them? And of course, um, my mind immediately goes to an activity that UCL is already doing, uh, which is run out of the law school at UCL called the Centre for Access to Legal Justice, which is actually based on the high street in the top front, in the Stratford High Street, um, really making the university embedded in the heart of retail and public space away from even the buildings that you've been discussing. But I wondered if we could use that question to talk about some of those debates uh, and tensions around university-led gentrification. Yeah, I mean, actually, the UCL East case is interesting because um, under the agreement with LLDC, we're actually not allowed to provide any retail space there. Um, And, um, you know, this varies from case to case. And I think the thing that my report underlined, which focused on um, cases in the UK and the the states, Newcastle, Cambridge, um, Durham in the UK and Columbia, 
um, Pennsylvania and NYU in the States. Um, it, it's underlined that every case is different. Um, and so, it, you know, it's difficult to kind of make kind of uni universal assumptions about what universities can or can do, can't do in, in different sites. But I mean, I think essentially the key is, and this very much came out of my research that, you know, um, consultation, not just consultation, but um, engagement with local communities from an early stage is absolutely essential to understanding, um, you know, what universities might have to offer in a particular area, what the specific sort of so social needs are, socioeconomic needs are, um, and trying to put, you know, structures in place to enable universities to respond to those challenges. And that is, of course, very complex and challenging work. And universities are not always the most agile of organizations. They're, you know, big institutions made up of many different parts. Um, I think something that we've all discovered, those of us who've been involved with the UCL East project from the early days, is that we often don't know what other people in the same university are actually doing. So I think it's also a question of coordination, um, sharing knowledge, um, and, and trying to build on, um, again, you know, as I've concluded with, you know, real data collection that enables universities to have a better understanding of, of the areas that they're actually um, intervening in. And I think the UNIFAS um, example that I started with is, is a very good example of that, although they're very hampered by lack of funding and, and sort of political will at the moment. Um, but that uh, campus development has very much grown out of years of local mobilizing for a university presence in the area, making specific demands as to, you know, what they want of, of that uh, campus. And so I think, again, it sort of reminds us that it's, you know, it's good to look, you know, to, to look towards sort of further horizons as well to inform our understanding of how these processes can be put in place and developed in, in different contexts. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just sort of jumping around in the questions to try and cluster them a bit because there is a there is a question which is a bit more uh, critical, perhaps, of UCL saying no one what but UCL <coughs> wants the university to be in the east. So why is there this social rhetoric and um, in the question saying um, it's not it's justifying it as local need is dishonest. So I wonder if that's an there is an opportunity to talk maybe for you to talk about some of the data that or, and work that we've done, which has been about interface, particularly through Urban Lab actually, which has been about really finding out what communities do need and want um, and, and filtering that back into the university, because I know that you have done that work over a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's quite true to say that UCL has justified its presence as a response to local need. I think, you know, the university has always been quite honest from the start that it needed more space. Um, you know, land in East London was relatively cheap. Um, there was a, an offer of government and um, mayoral support with this new campus inside the Olympic Park. But at the same time, it is embedded in the Olympics legacy regeneration program, um, which is, uh, you know, not just about UCL East, but about a whole number of different part partners, um, including all the big institutional partners on the East Bank. And a huge amount of work and discussion with the local councils in the surrounding five boroughs and a multitude of um, different local community organisations um, as part of this process. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there are a lot of academics who've been individually or, you know, within their departments working on research projects or with students to understand um, the conditions in local neighbourhoods better, such as our colleagues in the DPU, um, working with uh, residents of the Carpenters Road estate, for example. Um, and there has been, you know, a sort of a lot of hard work put into trying to translate that uh, knowledge and understanding into the formal processes which have driven the development of the UCL East project 
at UCL, first in UCL Estates, now in the, um, you know, the, the sort of freestanding UCL East project team, um, you know, which those processes which have been driven by different kinds of considerations to do with project management and, um, you know, being on time and on budget and have been um, subject to all of the conditions um, under which UCL has been working uh, with LLDC, the sort of legal framework and, and so on. So it is a very complicated process. And I think that, you know, we're heading towards um, a, a good result, but, you know, that we still all have to continue to work hard to ensure that UCL East will have a positive contribution to make to um, the local uh, cultural infrastructure, social infrastructure um, in different ways, working in a, you know, in a transdisciplinary and collaborative framework. Thanks, Claire. I mean, I pulled that question out because I think it is also important to show that we don't shy away from the difficult questions and that we're really thoughtfully engaging with the big issues that obviously projects of this scale and of this nature entail. Um, and uh, as much as UCL might be a harbinger of, of gentrification, which may not be welcomed by everyone, I think there are also really fantastic initiatives to think critically and do differently. So I'm also thinking of work by the Institute for Global Prosperity, working with residents of the area to develop alternative indexes of community well-being and prosperity, which have had a big impact on the landscape of development, actually, very locally in East London. Yeah, um, which Saffron Woodcroft will present later in the term, actually, so it'll be worth attending that lecture. But they've worked very closely with citizen sci scientists. Um, and also, one shouldn't underestimate the work, the you know huge amount of work done by UCL's public engagement team, again, dating back to 2013, um, working with local communities and, and organising a, a wide range of activities with schools um, and so on. So... Yeah, there is a lot of work there. It needs to be documented and presented properly so that we all understand what has actually um, taken place. Just shifting tone to the next question, which I think opens another really interesting set of issues. Um, someone asks, teaching in universities still generally focuses on three-year degrees and masters and PhDs. Do we need to broaden out from these sort of particular forms of teaching to facilitate greater connections to the wider city? And I think that's a really interesting question that I know we are talking about a lot across the range, across all the faculties that will be at UCL East. And I think, I mean, the urban room as a pedagogical space for informal learning is obviously a really exciting resource, isn't it? I don't know if you want to talk about the kinds of other ways of learning that we imagine developing through that space. Yeah, I mean, I think in the new sort of... Um programs that we're developing for UCL East, master's programs mainly, or at least from the, from the urban perspective, you know, are very much about engaging with a shift away from more traditional formats, um, placing uh, more of an emphasis on applied knowledge, knowledge working with communities, um, you know, developing field work <clears throat> and um, field work based projects. Um, a, a, you know, a sort of problem solving approach. So again, I think, you know, um, one has to remember that the whole sort of vision for UCL East was really to be able to develop um, a, a slightly less traditional kind of teaching than UCL has done historically. And that again is very much what the rationale for this project is all about. Um, and the fact that the site, you know, the new campus <clears throat> is based in the Olympic Park in a in a live uh, regeneration site is very exciting for us, particularly us urbanists, actually to be able to be out there at um, you know, close hand um, to our research sites is um, a really interesting opportunity, which again, I hope that we can make the most of and really inform how the ongoing development of that whole um, area of London, which will continue for many years, um, you know, again, takes shape in the best possible way. Thank you. And a, a question that just got up 
voted was um, is another sort of tack on this alongside thinking about really opening up the kinds of courses. Another, I know, important theme that we've been talking about as the sort of academic planning team has been sustainability and environmental considerations. And someone has asked, what are some of the ecological impacts that urban regeneration has had? And I wondered if you could speak a bit to that aspect of your work and research. Yes, well, I have to feel rather less positive about the ecological impacts of urban regeneration at the moment. And, you know, this is something that we're thinking about very much in a sort of post-COVID city context. Um, I think, you know, there has been far too much emphasis on the construction of huge new buildings, um, you know, with multi-storey basements, um, that although we have made huge strides in terms of um, you know, technology and building design for sustainability. And I know, again, you know, there are, you know, many, many architectural practices who are completely dedicated to the cause of sustainability. Nevertheless, you know, construction in itself is um, not necessarily a sustainable uh, kind of activity. And we probably do have to kind of turn our focus um, more to uh, thinking about, you know, really sort of radically alternative ways of providing space for our activities, repurposing existing space, um, and of course, engaging with these virtual networks that we've all been uh, plunged into over the last year to sort of blend physical and, and virtual um, activity, you know, bearing in mind, of course, that, you know, data also um, you know, uses an enormous amount of energy and is not particularly sustainable in itself. So these are very difficult questions, but I think we have to, you know, think very radically about how we remodel cities for the future um, in response to the climate emergency. And of course, as a, one of our fellow faculty leads, Kate Jones is, is stewarding <coughs> a whole project for UCL East called The Living Landscape, which recognises that we are in a park and, and uses the buildings, particularly the Pool Street building, um, to sort of think about how we can be, what she's um, developing a programme called Nature Smart. So just above the urban room, actually, there's going to be a green roof, which will be a citizen science space with a whole lot of uh, ongoing in interventions and experiments into the natural landscape and the environment of the park and our relationship to it. So that's a really interesting nexus as well for future projects and research in that space and site. Um, I think we've got time for one more question and uh, maybe this actually follows on uh, in terms of your own, the way in which you situate your own work. So I, um, uh, noticed actually in this links to the question that several of your slides had uh, exhibitions in the uh, in them at the end when you were showing the work of the urban room and you have this project called curating the city so the question asks can you talk a bit more about how you see curating and display as a part of this this project of um, understanding and really talking about the representation of urban regeneration through universities yeah, well, I suppose um, curating and display, yeah, it's all about representation and how, I, I mean, my interest is in very much in how, um, you know, quite radical transformative urban processes have been represented and looking back historically to the, you know, the, the sort of um, big post-war urban redevelopments, you know, of, often on bomb damage sites and the discussions that took place then um, between those in favour of rebuilding and and, re and and sort of restoration and those who, you know, inspired by a, a, a great deal of social idealism, um, you know, the, the, the modernists really, um, you know, committed themselves to rebuilding the cities in, in a new way that would actually provide better opportunities, you know, better, more social equality, more green spaces in cities, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that there's been such a sort of, I mean, now I'm speaking as um, an architectural historian, <laughs> but that there's been such a backlash against modernism and the sort of imagery representation of um, modernism, kind of forgetting about those social ideals that really drove, you know, what those architects, planners and thinkers were, 
were ho hoping to achieve at that time. And I think this, this sort of concept of curating is a, is a recognition that, um, yes, that, you know, that tabula rasa approach of, you know, pulling everything down and rebuilding from scratch isn't the right way to go, you know, especially now in terms of these questions about sustainability and that curating suggests uh, um, a, a more kind of um, a, a more uh, sensitive approach, pulling together different bits of the city um, in a, you know, in, in, and sort of kind of reassembling fragments into kind of new realities. And I think that that's very much what we're sort of driving at with um, the the work in our urban heritage cluster, curating the city and the Centre for Critical Heritage Studies, sort of, you know, which also draws on a lot of archaeological work. And we're working with archaeologists. So understanding cities as very layered um, spaces, layered both physically and socially, um, and, and trying to bring all of those layers into play with each other and recognise the value that they have for different people, different voices in different communities. And that, you know, also kind of relates very much to my own research, which has been based on ethnographic methods, um, bringing different voices into play in the way that cities are kind of articulated and, and understood. And communication is key to that, the way that, you know, the, the new ways that we find to um, communicate and represent those ideas in themselves. Great. I think that's a, a very good place to draw the <laughs> to a close on a kind of very positive note, actually, of new forms of engaged practice that the university can contribute to the ongoing project of the city, which is obviously so much more than the university, and to be humble in that process as well. Um, and thinking as curating is not just a top down process, but a process of co production mm. and community building as well. So thank you so much, Claire. That was a really rich talk. Um, there were some good questions, some tough questions, which you handled very well, and I think um, showed. <laughs> I think the ongoing commitment, particularly through Urban Lab, of really dealing with some of these complex questions and mediating them between the different communities that surround these big regeneration projects led by universities in collaboration with many other stakeholders, corporate and community. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your lunch breaks uh, to join us as well. Um, if you do want to find out more about upcoming lunch hour lectures, um, you can visit the UCL Minds webpage um, for the next uh, for the timetable for the rest of term. Um, and in the meantime, I just hope everybody keeps safe and well, uh, stays at home as much as they're <laughs> able to, um, um, but carries on joining with one another uh, through the means that we we do have through the internet and hope that we can all meet together in person in a not too distant future. So thank you. And thank you also to Matt Olcott and Sana al for helping us to organise uh, so seamlessly and smoothly the technology um, and administration of the event. So thank you both very much as well. Great. Take care, everybody, and we'll say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.